Do you know what makes a diamond beautiful? It's all the light that's reflected off of it. We've been looking uh, in this series on how God can use our lives as lights. And we know that we're not the light. Jesus is the light. We'll look at that scripture in a few minutes. But uh, we are to reflect that light. And we've looked at the different stages of making a diamond beautiful, mining it, discovering how God has made us, uh, planning, uh, discovering that God has already placed in us certain gifts and certain abilities that he is planning to use in our lives. We looked at cleaving, where the diamond is carefully cut, where that which belongs to it uh, and that which doesn't belong to it. And, and we realize that, hey, everything that we have, the treasures we have, they really belong to God. And he has placed them in our hands to be used only for his kingdom. And then last week, we looked at using our time because we looked at brooding. That was the, the longest, the time, most time-consuming uh, preparation for a diamond. And now the diamond's in the general shape, but the final stage is that we should uh, polish. It's called polishing and blocking. And without that, uh, the diamond would be dull and wouldn't shine. And there's, there's certain things about us that even though we might have the life of Christ in us, if these things are not taken care of, our life will be dull and people will not see the clear reflection of Christ. It's kind of a, a fascinating process. A polisher will start by placing the stone on a spinning wheel and slowly begin to get the different uh, facets of it, uh, different faces, so that they can reflect the light differently. In fact, a rough diamond uh, is polished into eight pavilion main facets and then eight crown facets, and then one table uh, facet. And during the brillianteering, and that's actually a word, brillianteering process, uh, the remaining facets of the diamond are added to make sure that the diamond reaches its full potential. Guess how many it needs? 57. 57 facets. And, and the facets are angled and aligned in per perfect perfect proportion when the light hits that diamond. It reflects in all directions. I believe uh, this is a beautiful picture of what God wants to do. He wants to shine his light into our lives in order that we would reflect that light to all the world. I want to read a scripture from Matthew chapter 5. This is part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount and Jesus was talking primarily to fishermen, to shepherds. Uh, these were not uh, kings and queens. Uh, these were ordinary people, just like you and I. We are ordinary people. And um, listen to what he said to them. He says in verse 13 of chapter 5, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its labor, flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it can give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father this portion uh, it was even more astounding to the people then than it is to us today for one thing uh, we think of salt as just something we use in cooking or maybe curing meat uh, we know that it's a preservative and and it's okay but you know we have salt everywhere it's pretty common do you know that when Jesus said this, salt was actually uh, like a wealth. You paid people in salt. In fact, early roads that were constructed were constructed so that salt could be transported from one place uh, to another. Uh, if you had to equate it to something today, uh, it would be oil. The, the salt 
uh, was so valuable. And when Jesus said to these common, ordinary people, you are the salt of the earth, he was saying, you are valuable. And you know what? He says that to us too. You are valuable. You're valuable to God and you're valuable to this world because the world so desperately needs to see the light that you have found. And then he told them, uh, not only you are valuable salt, but you are the light of the world. And, and when we think of light, there's some, some things that are pretty obvious about light. Light uh, is to be seen. We are uh, not uh, hiding lights because they, they need to be seen. They need to be open to everyone. And so it is. He said it was like a city set on a hill. You can't hide it. When somebody comes passing by, uh, you see it. I like to travel around Germany a little bit. And, and if you've traveled in Germany uh, some, you recognize that there's quite a few cities on hills. They don't want to use the good farmland in the valley. So the city's built up on a hill. And you can see it for miles away. Listen uh, to what Romans 13 uh, verses 12 to 14 says. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor uh, of right living. Because we belong to the day. We live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, or immoral living, or quarreling, or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. We are to be seen. We are to put on the armor of light. Uh, secondly, uh, when we think about light, we think of the fact that it is a guide. We, uh, we see that we can't see it without light. You wander around in darkness, you stumble and you fall. But light helps us to see. Uh, Ephesians 3 uh, says this, Don't participate in the things these people do, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. So uh, we are to produce a life that is good, does good things, that uh, is right. We, we, we are just. We do right and is true. We're not deceiving people. We're not tricking people. We're giving that which is true to others. There's one more use of a light that I want to mention because I think it's very important that we understand that light is also a warning. Uh, you can see danger when light reveals it. Uh, we have on the coast what we call lighthouses. And you know what they are, just a big tower with a strong light on the top. And it warns the ships, don't come near because there are rocks here or there's shallow here. And your life will be wrecked if you come close. And so it warns people. Uh, Ephesians 5 uh, tells us that our light and our lives are like a warning. It says, take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things of ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. When the light shines on them. Now let's look again at, at Matthew chapter 5. Uh, at this, this passage that he gave us, you are the light of the world. And no one lights a light and hides it, but he puts it on a stand so that all can see. And then he explains what the light is. The good deeds of your life are light that show others the glory of God. So let's take it part by part. First of all, uh, we need to realize that we can be light of the world for we reflect the true light. In John chapter 8, uh, Jesus uh, spoke to the people once more and said to them, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you have the light 
that leads to life. So we do not create the light. We reflect the light, just like a diamond does. There's no uh, internal lights in diamonds. It is only the outward light. And it doesn't take a lot of light. You know that. Just a little light on a diamond reflects. And it looks like the diamond itself is shining. We are the light as we follow him. Uh, not just believe. Now, we believe that salvation is by faith and, and not by works. But when salvation comes into our lives, what the world sees is not our inner beliefs. What the world sees is our actions. And those become the light that draw others to him. We are converted by faith, not by works, but faith without works is dead, according to James. Faith without works is meaningless. If I say I believe, but my actions say just the opposite, it won't affect anyone. Actually, it will affect people. It will affect people negatively. That's why so many people say, oh, the church is full of hypocrites. They say they love one another, but they are jealous and they gossip about each other and they criticize one another. And when those things happen, the light is dulled and people cannot see the true light of Jesus' love. Notice, uh, he says, uh, we can't hide our light. You can't be a, a undercover Christian. No such thing. It, it's impossible. You have to show your life to those around. It says, don't put it under a basket. Now, and some commentators have said a basket, this was a wheat basket uh, for carrying the wheat in or for grinding the wheat or maybe for mixing uh, the wheat into dough to make bread. And therefore, it, it reflects work. And one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to hide your light under your work. There are some people who live to work. And in reality, uh, we are to work to live. That's, that's my day job, we should call it. My real job is following Jesus Christ, is being his disciple. Don't let work become that which hides your light. If you read the passage over in Mark, a parallel passage. Let me read it for you. Jesus asked them, would anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. The lamp is placed on a stand uh, where light will shine. So here he uses the basket illustration. Don't hide it under a basket. It won't do any good. And don't put it on your bed. I've also often thought, wow, uh, when he talks about light in those days, it's fire. That would be a little bit dangerous if you put it under a bed. Some have said bed could be equated with laziness. The, the Christian walk is not for lazy people. It's hard work. We, uh, we have to discipline ourselves and use our time and use our abilities and use our gifts correctly and that's work. That's work. Anyone who's too lazy to read his Bible will not reflect the light of God's love. Anyone that's too lazy to take time to pray or to come to church and encourage others, anyone who's too lazy uh, to do the disciplines that need to be done, giving yourself not just to other believers, but to those unbelievers around you, showing them the light of Christ, your light will be hidden. So don't hide it under a bed. Don't hide it under a basket because light is not to be hidden. Thirdly, he says, we must position our light for others to use. Now, uh, as I make this recording, I have two lights sitting here. They're on stands and we position them so that they would give the maximum light. And uh, so it must be and, and it is. In your house, where do you put lights? Do you stick them over in a corner, pointing at the corner? Of course not. You position them so they give light to the whole room. And that's exactly what he says. Uh, place them on a stand, raised up, so that the light can shine to all. Now, what does it bring uh, light to? And, and this, is, this is the part we need to understand. It is not to bring light upon our lives. Because if it brings light upon our lives, 
we missed the whole point. Uh, in this same Sermon on the Mount, I want to read a few verses in chapter 6. And here's how Jesus says it. Watch out. <laughs> I like that. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give someone to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward that they'll ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. We are not doing good deeds. We're not living right so that people would praise us. If you are, you've, you've got your reward. You've missed out on the reward that God wants you to have. So it's not for shining on you. It's for all in the house to see. And I really believe that when you read the Bible, you, you need to understand that there are no wasted words in the Bible. Let the members of your household see your good deeds. Let the way you treat your spouse, your husband or wife, let the way that you treat your children show the world the light of Jesus Christ. You know where it's hardest to let our light shine? <laughs> That's right, at home. At home, because they see us when we're grumpy. They see us uh, before our coffee in the morning. They see us when we're tired at night. They see us when we're discouraged. But even in those times, let your light shine. The story is told of an evangelist. He had a, a workman working on his house. And uh, uh, everything went wrong that day. The electricity went out. His power tools wouldn't work. Uh, he had the wrong fittings. Uh, it, it just seemed like a horrible day. And at the end of the day, uh, he said to the evangelist, he said, well, you don't have any electricity now. Why don't you come over to my house and have supper with me? And the evangelist was a little he hesitant and said, well, yeah, I hate to be a bother. And he said, no, no, my wife and our kids, they love to have guests in. So will you come? So they got in the and his old beat up uh, work truck and they drove over to his house. And when he got out, uh, he knew what kind of day this man had had and he followed the man up to uh, the door. But before he got to the door, the man reached over to a little tree and held a couple of the leaves tightly in his fingers for just a few minutes. And then they went in. And he played with the kids and he hugged his wife and he, he spent the whole evening telling how good things were and how uh, great, grateful he was to have the job and how great things worked. And as they finished the meal and the evangelist said, I need to get back. And he said, yeah, I'll give you a ride back to your place so you can sleep. Uh, they went back out and the man again held on to the leaves of the tree for just a moment and then went on. And the evangelist said, this was too much for him. He said, you, you've got to tell me, what happened? You were discouraged. You were upset. It was an awful day. But when you got home, everything seemed to be good. And he's, he, I noticed you held that little tree out there in the front yard. Is there some significance to that? And he said, yeah, when I come home, I hang all my troubles and all the woes on that little tree and so I don't carry them into the home and destroy uh, the love and the goodness there. And in the morning, usually I go out and I touch that tree again. And you know what? The troubles don't seem nearly as big as they were the night before. Maybe it's a good practice that some of us need to learn uh, that the, the problems of the world or the problems of the day, we need to lay them aside. Maybe you don't have a tree to hang them on. Maybe it's the the front door. And this day, when you're working at home, maybe it's, it's your uh, laptop or something, just to hang them somewhere and uh, turn them over so that they don't ruin your testimony to those, for those in the household. First John 3.10 uh, says this, so now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Pretty stark words, aren't they? 
Uh, we can tell who are children of God and children of the devil because they live righteously and they show love, especially to those who are of the household, the household of faith, the household that you live in. Jesus patterned this idea of caring for his own family. Do you remember when he was on the cross? One of the things he did as the eldest son of his mother, he made sure that she was taken care of. And he said to his apostle John, John, behold, this is your mother. And he said to his mother, this is your son. And it says from that day forward, John took care of Jesus' mother. He was concerned about his mother when he was in agony upon the cross. And we must do our good deeds so that our household, first of all, knows about it. Not some show at church that everybody says, wow, he's such a nice person, but at home we're a different person. That's not what is meant here. And then one more point. We must use our light to attract others to God. Let your deeds shine for all to see that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You say, wait, wait a minute. Aren't they supposed to praise him because of his grace and because of his love? You're the only Bible that your neighbors maybe will ever read or that your colleagues at work will ever see. You're the only Bible that some of your relatives will ever pick up. And they need to see the love of Christ in you. In 1 Peter 2, it says this, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of wrongdoing, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You see, your, your light is not just for no purpose. It is for the purpose of drawing others to see Jesus Christ. When you reach out and do a kind deed, you don't have to make a big deal about it. You don't have to jump up and down and, and say, everybody, look what I'm doing here. Uh, but you must do it in a way that people see God's goodness and see God's grace. Some cl conclusions I want us uh, to look at. First of all, we do not become Christians by good works, okay? That, that We need to make sure that's clear. It is by faith in Christ. If you have Put your faith, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it is by faith, not by, by uh, good works. It is by the grace of God that we can have our sins forgiven, that we can become part of his family. Secondly, our conversion will be marked by a change in lifestyle. You know, sometimes we spend so much time talking about the grace of God and forgiveness of God, but the Bible spends a lot of time talking about changing the lifestyle. Those who steal, steal no more. Those who lie, stop lying because you're a part of the family of God. Those who are deceitful must put it away. Those who are jealous must put it away. Over and over again, Paul admonishes people, take off that old coat of deceit and, and wickedness and put on the armor of light. Put on the coat of God in our lives. Our conversion will be marked by a different lifestyle. A lifestyle that is a lifestyle of righteousness. Now, that's a big word, but it just simply means doing what's right. Doing what's right with those around us. Honesty. Integrity. Integrity means that our actions match up with our words. Truth. Kindness. And love. Those are the, the kind of actions that the world needs to see today. When there's so much division and hatred, there's so much uh, blaming going on, it is a time that we need to say, look, the word of God tells me to love even my enemies and to do good even to those that despitefully use me and to pray for them. Those are the kind of actions that will change the world. Our testimony, number three, will only have credence when people see are good works. If you just say, I'm a, I'm a believer, and you cheat somebody, they won't believe you. Uh, or they will blame all Christians uh, are like that. Uh, 
I've read it and I've, I've said it to you before, but I'm saying it again. People don't care what you know. They don't care about how much Bible you know or how, much, uh, how many verses you've memorized until they know that you care. We are not called uh, to be uh, followers who are, have memorized the whole Bible. We we're called to be followers that follow Jesus Christ and to walk in his way. Our actions will tell what's going on on the inside. Number four, our good works will be rewarded by God and not necessarily by the world. If you're uh, expecting that people will, will be excited because you're honest, uh, you probably better forget that. I had a very good friend in my very first church, uh, and he was a manager of a small singer sewing machine uh, shop. And because he was honest, his manager above him kept giving him trouble and giving him bad reports. And eventually, uh, he was let go for a time. But eventually, uh, the higher-ups in the company said, well, wait a minute. He seems to be doing things honestly, and yet his shop's doing better than some of the other ones. And in the end, uh, he ended up with the largest shop in Oregon. Uh, why? Because he was honest, because he did the right thing, not because he was expecting the company to do something for him. If you're doing good deeds because you want rewards, you're doing it for the wrong reason. We do good things because we reflect the goodness of God. Number five, our world will be amazed by our walk with Christ. And then they will ask, why are you so different? You see, if there's no difference between the life of a Christian and the life of a non-Christian, why would non-Christians be interested in it? They have to see something in your life and in my life that makes them want to know. 1 Peter 3, 14 to 16, one of my favorite verses about giving our testimony, because this talks about words, but it has to have actions first. Listen how he starts. But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of the threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about the hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Do this with a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. And then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what good life you live because you belong to Christ. You see what it's saying there? If we're mistreated by the world or accused of things that are wrong, but we're doing the right thing, the world will be open to hear our testimony, to hear the truth about God's forgiveness and God's love. Your world will be amazed. And, and over and over again, the early church, remember I said there's a bunch of farmers and fishermen? They turned the world upside down. They changed the whole system of the world because they lived righteously. Uh, here in Europe, the early Christians grew and made a difference because they adopted the babies that non-believers were throwing out to die. Uh, because they lived honest lives and they gave themselves to hard work. Being a Christian uh, only takes a, a second of, of, of real faith in God by God's grace. But living as a Christian takes every moment of every day. We've got to understand that. So what should we do? What should we do? First of all, uh, if you want to reflect the light, you have to spend time with the light. You've seen these little lights that... Uh, you put in your garden or you put in, uh, we have some in our planter boxes out here. And uh, uh, one time I, I noticed one of them wasn't working and I thought, oh, something's gone wrong with it. But when I went out and, and looked at it, I discovered the plants had grown up around it and it got no light during the daytime and therefore it had no light at night. We need to be recharged daily. You, you have to spend time with God. Spend time in his word. Spend time allowing his light to flow into your life. Number two, uh, be willing to sacrifice your time and energy to help others. 
Someone has said uh, our lives should be like candles. They give forth light, but at the same time, they're expending their own life. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing if we could burn out for Christ rather than rust out uh, for greed. You know, I, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have to be willing to sacrifice. Does it take time to help others? Does it take time to be kind and to live right? Yes. But think of all that God has done for us. Can we do any less than show his love to those around us? Number three, be light at home. How you treat those closest to you is who you really are. It's who you really are. It's not what happens out in public or even at your job or at church. It's how you treat those that are around you. Are you kind to them, even if they aren't kind to you? Are you uh, helpful to them, even when it's not your job? One of the things I often uh, tell couples getting married or newly married couples is that they, they should play a little game. The game is uh, called Because I Love You. I give them one card, not two, but one card, and on it it says, because I love you. And I said, look for ways to do something nice for the other person uh, that's not your responsibility. You know, if, it, if you're just doing your job, it's not a special thing. It's not a because I love you, but look for little things, something that you do uh, out, of the, out of the way for the other person, not, not buying big gifts or things like that, but just doing something for them. And when you do, place the little card, because I love you. And then your spouse, uh, it's kind of like the game of tag, you know, tag, you're it. Your spouse has the card then, and they have to look for something to do it back and forth. Uh, Marilyn and I have probably worn out three or four of those cards, and uh, the purpose is not to keep passing the card around. The purpose is to make it a habit in your life. I would suggest that, that uh, you begin to make it a habit to do something nice for those in your household, to look for a way that you can bless someone out of your household every week, and, and do it as a discipline until it becomes a joy and it becomes a habit of your life. Uh, number four, and this is the last one, be consistent. No one likes an unreliable light. It's just, it's, it's so irritating. You've been places, I've been places where the lights are flickering on and off and on and off. It just irritates people. Don't be a flickering light. Seek to show his light each day. Now, are we going to have bad days? Yeah, we are. And we are going to have to go back and say, I'm sorry, I, I really blew that. Uh, that's not who I am, and that's not what I want to portray. But as much as possible, by the power of God. You see, there's a scripture that says, it is God working in you to will and to do his good deeds. To will, that means that he even gives us the motivation. But sometimes we, we stop there. God gives me the motivation. I want to do good things. But it says he also gives us the power to do. He will help you if you'll set your mind to it. Your light will shine because of the good deeds that you do to touch others. So that's the question. Are you shining his light? Can others see Christ in you by what you do? Or is it just by your words? You say, well, they, they have to follow my words. Well, they only do that if they see the love of Christ in you. I want to pray for us. I want to pray for me because sometimes it's easy for me to get caught up doing all the good things that a pastor does, working on sermons, studying the Bible. And I forget that I'm also a follower of Christ. I need to be looking for those around me that need a helping hand, that need an encouraging word, that need to see the light of Christ shining in them. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the light that has shined into our lives, that Jesus Christ was the light of life that came into this world. And because of him, we have found newness of life. Maybe there's some that are saying, wow, my life has not been changed. I pray that, Lord, even this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whenever they're watching this, that they would ask you, Lord, 
come into my life. Let that light shine in me, forgiving my sins, changing my motivation, changing my heart, so that I can begin to live as you want us to do. And Lord, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, help us be careful not to hide our testimony under our work or under our laziness. Lord, uh, the danger of the church today is comfort. It's more comfortable not to get out there and take a risk at helping other people. It's, it's, it's more comfortable uh, just to focus on our needs and our wants. Forgive us for that, Father. And help us to look with the eyes of Jesus as he saw the people. It says he had compassion and he was moved with compassion. He fed the hungry. He healed those who needed healing. And, and even if we don't uh, believe that we are Jesus, we aren't, uh, Lord, we have the power of Christ in us. The Holy Spirit is working through us. And Lord, we know that your word says that uh, we will do the same works that he did and greater works because we can reach out to more and more people for Christ. I thank you, Father, that you are shining your light today into this world and it's reflecting off of your people, off of your children, and the whole world can see your love and your goodness. Help us to be that light right where we live. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to speak with you and to share the word with you. On Sunday mornings, we do a short Zoom meeting uh, at uh, 1030 on Sunday mornings. Uh, I think you get the link on that. If you don't, write me, and I'll be sure to give you one so you can uh, join us face-to-face. In a few weeks, it looks like if things continue the way they're going, we'll be able to start meeting in person again, uh, for those of you who can. And we'll keep on recording. We'll record at church then, uh, for those who can't uh, make it yet. We are believing that God is working in our midst, and we are so thankful for that. May the Lord bless you with a great day serving him, showing the light of Christ.